Kids One, Godfather's Part One. Biggest ever drug importation. Corruption is inevitable. Number one target. Future in the head. Very interesting. This is Holland's most secure jail. Inside is a special unit holding some of Europe's top criminals. Among them is one of Britain's wealthiest godfathers, Curtis Warren. Once dismissed as just another scally in a shell suit, he became customs number one target, responsible for some of the biggest ever drug importations into Britain. With direct links in all the major drug supply countries, he built a personal fortune estimated at 150 million pounds, plenty to buy, even police officers. But Curtis Warren liked to talk, and investigators liked to listen, so tonight we go one-to-one -one with Curtis Warren and his friends and reveal the incriminating phone conversations that a British jury was not allowed to hear. He thought he was untouchable, even to the point of bribing a senior police officer to get criminal charges dropped against his friend. This part's in charge of the case, yeah? Yeah. So what I've said to him, I'll give him a couple of grand this morning, right? Yeah. I've said if he gets bail tomorrow, I'll give you another eight, right? Yeah. And when all the charges are dropped, I'll give you another ten, and he's agreed with that. Warren views justice like drugs, a quick fix to be purchased at the right price. This is the story of the boy from the back streets of Liverpool who made it to the Sunday Times rich list, and how the Dutch police tapped his phones to prove he was the chief executive of a multinational drugs empire. It became clear that Curtis Warren had got contacts all over the globe. He had uh, reliable contacts in South America. He had contacts in Holland, contacts in Turkey, all of which are good source countries for supplying narcotics. We still don't know everything about him. Uh, we were arresting for cocaine. We know a part of his network. The, the fact that he communicated on the, on the highest level to the Colombians will say that he's a very important European criminal, I think one of the most important uh, criminals over here. Curtis Francis Warren, age 36, was born on the 31st of May 1963 in Upper Parliament Street, part of the Toxteth neighbourhood of Liverpool. His father, now retired, was a merchant seaman from Latin America, and his mother, a cleaner, was born on Bird Island, South Africa. As a youth, he spent a few years at a North Wales boarding school, a refuge for inner-city kids. But his turf was Granby Street, known as the front line, where the Toxteth riots erupted in 1981 when Warren was 18. In the aftermath of the riots, Liverpool's alternative businessmen found the Granby Street neighbourhood a fairly safe place to sell drugs, especially as most local residents believed that the police had given up enforcing the law there. Soon a new local capitalist economy emerged and Curtis Warren became its key entrepreneur. He began by selling £10 bags of cannabis in Granby Street, exploiting a network of seafaring families who had smuggled ganja into Liverpool for generations. Warren already had an extensive criminal record, which started when he was 12. At 15, he was sentenced to three months in a detention center. Borstal and jail quickly followed. He stole cars and broke into houses before graduating to ram raiding, robbery, and possession of a firearm. When he met his girlfriend, Stephanie, he was also introduced to a successful Liverpool businessman, her father, Philip Glennon. 
Warren became part of the family, just as his own career began to flourish. He rapidly moved from street trader to wholesaler. Curtis was a, a what we might call a commodity broker. Um, he didn't get involved at the uh, at the street level end. He wasn't involved in uh, the retail end, if you like. Um, but he could supply the goods. He had the, the confidence of the of the producers in the source countries. And uh, without him, um, the drug dealers on the streets of Liverpool and everybody else couldn't survive. Warren was now targeted by British Customs and Police as they discovered he was dealing directly with the Colombian drug barons. He was photographed at Heathrow with Middlesbrough businessman Brian Charrington returning from a meeting with the notorious Cali cartel in South America. In September 1991, shortly after their visit, a container ship left Caracas in Venezuela bound for the port of Felixstowe. On board, 28 tons of lead ingots. Hidden inside them, aluminium boxes containing cocaine. Customs, acting on a tip-off, were waiting to inspect the cargo, but the search was negative. Impervious to x-rays, the ingots were so big that anyone who did not know exactly where to drill had little prospect of finding the cocaine. So one and a half tons of the drug with a street value of 250 million pounds, were imported into Britain. Yet again, Warren had escaped detection. In January 1992, another huge load was on its way, using the same method. When we opened the containers, we found uh, lead ingots of this nature. This is a miniature a replica of one of the ingots. During one lunch break, one of our more experienced senior officers uh, picked up a hammer and thought he'd cut short the uh, exploratory investigation being made by hitting the bottom of the ingot with a hammer. And it was found that on either edge of the ingot there was a ringing sound, but when he hit the, the middle, there was a dull thud, and he established he, he was happy in his own mind from that that there was cocaine inside the ingot. Customs extracted the cocaine and allowed the shipment through, tracking it to Liverpool. Warren, Brian Charrington and seven others were arrested and charged. But Charrington was released after two Teesside detectives said he had been working for the police as a supergrass, informing on the Felixstowe shipments. Customs officers were furious as they had believed Charrington was smuggling drugs as well as acting as a police informer. But worse was to come for customs when the judge at Warren's trial in Newcastle ruled that crucial surveillance evidence was inadmissible. Warren walked free, escaping a 25-year jail sentence. On his way out of court, he taunted customs officers. I'm off to spend my 87 million pound share and you can't touch me. Throughout the 50-day trial, his family friend Philip Glennon sat at the back of the court always on hand to provide support. Warren's base was still Liverpool. Drugs were flooding into the city, and he had a keen interest in the security firms which ran the doors of the clubs and pubs, a prime avenue of distribution. Curtis Warren's increasing wealth and power began to upset some of Liverpool's traditional crime families, so they decided to teach him a lesson. He was kidnapped, blindfolded, and taken to a secret location where he was held for a day and given a few slaps before his abductors let him go. More to the point, they refused to pay the £50,000 they owed him for a recent consignment of drugs. After Warren's release, he met an old associate and fellow gangster, Johnny Phillips, on the street. Phillips was an enemy of David Ungi, a member of a rival gang thought to be moving in on Warren's territory. Phillips also had his own dispute to settle. On May Day 1995, Ungi was on his way to a meeting when he was ambushed as he approached rival turf.
two men in a Volkswagen GTI shot and killed him. In the next month, a gangland war erupted which was used to settle long-standing feuds. It also claimed many innocent victims. First tonight, a man's been shot dead in a betting shop. My partner, Owen, was shot in broad daylight. Another ordinary Liverpool street, another shooting. As he leaned down the door, he just leaned over me and shot me twice. And the second man stepped in and shot me three times. From January 1995 to April 1996, 53 people were wounded and five shot dead. Liverpool became a battleground as the crack of the Tokarev and the Uzi became the new Mersey Sound. People were being shot, and I suppose putting everything together and considering his own security and the continuing success of his operation, um, he reached the conclusion that um, his, his own best interest will be best served by moving to the Netherlands. Warren's operations were now global, and he didn't want the heat of a neighborhood gun war to damage his business. So he moved and set up home in Sassenheim, a sleepy Dutch village near Amsterdam. Here, he thought he could escape the gunfire and the growing attention of British investigators and also continue his lucrative trade with the Colombians. But in part two, target one is unaware he's in the sights of a weapon far more effective than a gun. Part two. Moran believed that Amsterdam, with all its bars and brothels, could provide a safe haven for his growing drugs empire, away from the prying eyes and ears of the British investigators. But he underestimated the powers of the Dutch police, their ability to tap his phones, and their right to use his taped conversations as evidence against him in the courts. For six months, from May till October 1996, a special squad called the Mix Team listened in to hundreds of conversations between Warren and his henchmen. It became clear that Warren claimed to have a key police source in Liverpool, known as the L Fella. He passed on information that detectives believed Warren had ordered the hit on David Ungi, and then had the two assassins shot when they fled to Jamaica. The Dutch police discovered this when they intercepted a phone call between Warren and Tony Bray, one of his associates back in Liverpool. You seen the, uh, you know the old fella? Yeah. The special people have got the blood in Jamaica looking for the body to the other two. Yeah. This is what they've got down. You give the orders to the other fella. They've done the business for you and then you get them out to Jamaica, right? Yeah. Because they want them all money to keep them out, shut. They've got a town, so you have got the connections with gangsters there, so you get them slots. Mad, isn't it? Yeah. Meanwhile, back in Liverpool, Warren's friend, Philip Glennon, had a problem with his son. Glennon Jr. discharged a decommissioned gun after a dispute at this nightclub. He'd been charged with a serious offence. So Warren again called on his Liverpool contact, the L fella, to help by trying to get the charge dropped. But the L fella was no ordinary policeman, as the Dutch police realized when they intercepted this phone call between Curtis Warren and Philip Glennon. Is that more Davis to give? I've shot them two grams a day. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. The fella they've got, he's in charge of the thing, yo. Yeah. Yeah, the old thing, right? And he says, they're not pursuing it to get all mileage out of it, and this and that, right? The blood are going to drop. Probably drop theirs in the morning, them charges and things, you know what I mean? Elmore Davis was a detective chief inspector in Merseyside Police and former deputy chief of the Forces Drug Squad. He was the L fella, Warren's newfound friend and ultimately in charge of the case against Glennon Jr. And it appeared that Davis was accepting money in return for secret and sensitive information to help undermine the evidence. The intermediaries acting for Warren were Micah Hearn, better known as Warrior, the TV gladiator, 
and Tony Bray. According to another conversation between Tony Bray and Warren, Davis had also passed on information about another British police operation. Right, the, the code name for the operation is Spigot. Yeah. And that's the code name for you as well. So if they sight you, they don't have to say they've seen the CW, they just say we've seen the Spigot. I wonder what that means. Two Spigots go together, like, tightens things up, don't they? Warren was also intrigued to know how Davis and the police viewed him. Got me down as a bit crafty. Oh, I know you crafty. What did he say about me? He said, I'll tell you what, let me tell you, he said, there's national, international and Super League, and you're well into the Super League. Warren was now in the Super League because of his links with Quinceno Botero, a leading Colombian godfather. Botero was the main target of the Dutch phone tappers. And they had discovered that Warren and Botero were setting up another major deal. During this time, the summer of 1996, Warren was enjoying life in Amsterdam, spending his evenings in the red light district, but all the time directing operations from his quiet Dutch retreat, planning another huge shipment of cocaine stashed inside aluminium ingots, unaware the Dutch police knew his every move. It was not destined for Rotterdam, but for Bulgaria. But we thought that uh, they would try to rip it off from the port and bring it into Holland. At the end, that was not the plan. They were uh, planning to bring it to Bulgaria and from there to Holland. But on base of the conversations, we had enough evidence and our prosecutor fought to, to arrest him. So we made the decision to seize the cocaine and arrest goods. Drugs worth 100 million pounds were seized at Rotterdam docks and from the homes of his associates. One of his gang had three hand grenades under his pillow, ready for action. Warren was arrested in bed with a Ukrainian prostitute. Dutch police demanded maximum security at the court in The Hague as Warren was convicted and jailed for 12 years for conspiracy to smuggle drugs and leading an organized crime gang. And since the trial, in 1997, British Customs and Police have arrested over 120 people, many of whom are thought to be part of his organization. But investigators suffered a setback when charges against Philip Glennon for perverting the course of justice were not proceeded with at Nottingham Crown Court. Vital phone conversations between Glennon and Warren where they discussed paying £20,000 to Elmore Davis, the L fella, to get the charges dropped against Glennon Jr., were never heard by the jury, as the Dutch tapes were ruled inadmissible. But other conversations between Davis and Micah Hearn, better known as the TV gladiator warrior, were recorded by Merseyside police using a listening device placed in the roof of a flat they shared. And this was ruled admissible, providing crucial evidence. So Davis, Ahern, and Warren's intermediary, Tony Bray, were all convicted and jailed. Davis got five years for corruption, but with Ahern has now won the right to challenge the conviction at the Court of Appeal. Give him two grand. Yeah. Tell him, if he gets the charges dropped, he can have another 18 grand. But don't he want the statements and all that? Yeah. Get me the statements, right? But tell him, if he drops the charges, yeah? Yeah. He can have another 18 grand. And as the following conversation suggests, Davis wasn't Warren's only police contact. What did he say about the other people we had? What did the other fellas say? He said he can have more than one person. Yeah. But he won't ask who, and he doesn't want to know. And in this confidential Dutch police report, Reference is made to a secret file about probable suborning contacts with the Merseyside police. As soon as Warren was jailed, he appealed against his conviction, but the appeal was recently rejected by the Dutch Supreme Court. His lawyer still claims 
that British Customs and Police had been tapping Warren's phones without informing the Dutch authorities. An illegal act. Under Dutch law, um, we have the theory of the fruits of the poisonous tree. So if, if you can establish that the beginning of an operation is illegal, then the rest of the evidence will be regarded as fruits of that poisonous tree, so there will be no evidence uh, for a court to convict a person on. Now the case may go to the European court. Meanwhile, the race is on to find his fortune. Well, there are indications that he, he secreted money all over the place, not just in the UK, Europe, um, as far afield as Turkey, um, well-known tax havens. Um, and it's a mammoth job trying to assess just how much cash there is and where it's stashed. Um, this is the job that the Dutch face. Um, they're getting on with it, and whenever possible, we're trying to help them. In October 1997, police dug up a flower bed in Philip Glennon's garden and found one and a half million pounds. Mr. Glennon says it's legitimate money from his business. So far as Warren is concerned, he's saying nothing, and his Dutch lawyer maintains that his wealth is a media myth. You've no idea what assets, if any, um, the Dutch authorities have tracked back to Curtis Warren's sort of private property. I have no idea. I know that the Dutch police has seized, uh, I think, a Volvo car uh, at the moment of his arrest and a couple of telephones and, and uh, a chair, etc., in the house he rented. But as far as I know, uh, that's about the only assets um, uh, that are involved. Since then, investigators have tracked down £20 million worth of property, ranging from shops in Liverpool to upmarket garages, a winery in Bulgaria, and hundreds of houses in Turkey and the UK. Warren also faces manslaughter charges after a Turkish prisoner died following a fight. Yes, I think he was uh, on the top of a very big, uh, important uh, criminal organization. You can see that because he can, could do business with all kinds of people uh, on a very high level. And I think that's an indicator that he's important. Yes. You can describe it maybe as a, as a leader of a multinational. With good behavior and remission, Curtis Warren should walk free from this Dutch prison in just a few years. But will the man they called the Teflon Don for his ability to escape conviction in the UK return to his old ways and spend his ill-gotten gains? I was just checking the price on uh, those big posh chair bowls. Yeah, how much? 100 grand. Now that's a lot of money, mate. Yeah. You get one? I might do, uh, what was I going to say, one of those uh, C36 makes, innit? Yeah, I'm a C36 mate. Well, I'm Thank you. 